Well, one of the biggest problems, Mike, is that uh, you're a newcomer to the business. Um, nobody knows you particularly, although I know you've worked in various charity shows and uh, and I know you've done pantomime, um, but selling to clubs and promoters, age, other agents, etc., is going to prove somewhat difficult to That's begin right. with. That's you right. know, it's it's not as easy as it sounds. Basically, all people want to know, particularly promoters, fellow agents, club secretaries, all they want to know is what you do on stage. I don't suppose I don't suppose that it will bother them uh, that your background um, uh, or that you have any secrets to hide. I, what's the point? I mean, that's what ten years ago. There's a lot of people in in this business who've got worse skeletons than covered them myself. Yeah? yeah, me for instance. <laughs> I can't. Um, no, I can't. Um, I can't see that having any um, adverse effect at all. That's good. I am what I am. I don't want praise. I don't want pity. I bang my own drum. Something is noise. The Ritz Ballroom, Manchester. Last time I was here, they made me wipe my feet on the way out. <laughs> when I arrived, I was in the fire, and there was loads of people around. And this fella said to me, he said, I'm going to show you the most amazing trick you've ever seen. I said, you're not. He said, I am. And he showed me this. I said, what's this? He said, it's a birth controller for elephants. <laughs> I said, thanks for the laugh. It's me and you against the rest. <laughs> he said, it's a completely transparent tube with a hole either end, like that. I said, that's why there's so many elephants. <laughs> he said, what you do, you take the tube, and you take a handkerchief, and you push the handkerchief all the way into the tube, like that. And then you just give a little blow. Ah, I'm glad that worked. That was the kingpin of the whole act. And then you take the other handkerchief, which is in the pocket, like that, the blue one. And along with the red one, you just push it into the tube. And of course, he explained to me that the audience can see what's happened. You can see what's happened, can't you? Look, nod your head. Yeah, lovely. And then you turn the tube around, and you take the other handkerchief, which is in your pocket, the yellow one. There we are. Look at that. And you push that also into the tube, like so. All the way into the tube. And what he explained to me is that the audience can see what's happening. You, you can't see what's happening, can't you, love? You see, I'm pushing the handkerchief into the tube, and as the tube's transparent, you should be... Yeah, right, we'll forget that. Could I have a drum roll, please? Oh, he's woke up. <laughs> I see you come from Mansfield. That's right. Yeah. Did you actually come from Mansfield today? Yeah, yeah, I came all the way today. It's a long distance. How long did that take you? About two and a half hours. Good one. Thank you for coming all that distance. That's right. Now, how old are you, Michael? I'm 21. Uh, let's get one thing straight, actually. It's got Michael on your phone, but that sounds very formal. Can I, can I call you Mike? Mike, Mike. Is that what people normally call you? That's about it. <laughs> right, we'll, we'll call you Mike. Um, Mike, how long is it since you left school? Five years ago. And what have you been doing since you left school? The only jobs I've ever done are entertaining. Actually. Really? Yeah, I do. So this is really what you want to do? You want to get into the field of comedy and progress up the show business ladder? Hopefully. <laughs> Super. Right, Mike, obviously I, I can't tell you right at this moment, but we are in the office from Monday and we start allocating, so you should hear one way or another 
by probably the end of next week. Thanks so sure. many thanks for coming all that distance. Okay. Every success to you. Yeah. Safe journey home. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. This, I think, will have to continue in the future. So, for instance, what are your future plans? Well, my immediate future is uh, I've got a job, a job offer, a definite, you know, job, which I feel I've worked very bloody hard to get, um, and which could do me a lot of good. And I, I get anxious because I think, well, the stepping stone between me and the job is not the fact that whether I'm really good enough to do the job, is more, did the arm office, will, will they approve me doing the job? And, it, you know, I mean, I sit on my bed and I think of this, and yeah. it's, it's very distressing at times. Well, know? I don't think it's a matter of the home office approving whether you get this particular job or not. I think the home office, as humans, would be behind you to make a success of it. That's perfect. Uh, that happens, uh, you know, I mean, but within the framework of law that they have to deal with, you'll have to have another social worker, supervisor, yeah. and okay. another psychiatrist. Yeah. What I want to know, obviously, we're talking about holiday centres. Yeah. How much do you know about holiday centres? Only what I've been told. Uh, you've, you've never I've actually been on a holiday centre on holiday, obviously. No, no. So, in your mind's eye, how do you see the job? Uh, bloody hard work. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I'm glad you said hard work, because really, from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night, that spotlight is on you all the time. This is basic show business. You move from table to table. Try and imagine that you have a party at home. Mm and you invite a hundred friends. You'd never sit with the one person all night. You would move around and socialize. And that basically is what the job is all about. Now, it's a long day and it's a long season, so you've got to have lots of stamina to keep that smile going. Uh, your uniform is provided free. Uh, your food, your accommodation is all provided free of charge. And the basic wage is 53 pounds a week. Come on. Sing up. Sing up. Could we ask you off the trampoline for about ten minutes, please? Only ten minutes, because we're going to give the little ones a go, all right? No, not, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. Not yet. It's too eager. I can't get down. I can't get down, I've got you. All commitments are here at the devil, right? Now, after that, you know, you will all step forward and we'll all start singing this. After that, us two step back. Jacqueline steers forward. She sings Akadol, right? After that, you go in. You two sing Spettle Frogs. Then after that, I'll come in with the 12th of Never, right? The maker of the original documentary, Frank Rodham, now a Hollywood director, came to see Minnie but found him depressed. Even when you were ten years old, the first thing you said to me was that you want to be your own man. That's right. And now you've got a chance to be your own man, and it's the first time you've been out of an institution. It should be great. Well, I'm happy to be away from that place, right, because I ain't got them breathing down the neck, you know. So I'm quite happy about that, but I, I just get a bit frustrated at times. <laughs> Why? I'm just not really happy with the, the duties I'm doing at the moment. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a magician, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a, a, a kids' games organiser or something like that. Uh, yeah, I know, but this, you remember, you can't always have what you want straight away. That's you right, yeah. 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 <coughs> I cope with it, like, I mean, it could get better, yeah. Yeah. I'm just not very confident with the children, and it it's, gets me a bit frustrated. I want you to do a backward somersault and sing The Hills Are Alive at the same time. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and if he rolls off, I want everybody to pray. Oh. <laughs> Auntie Bunny, we've got one wants to go to the toilet. Whoa! Go steady now. Don't do anything daft. Well, that's right. No, I mean, you've always been disappointed. As long as I've known you, you've always 
being unhappy with your circumstances. Do you think that's just because, or are you asking for too much, maybe? Perhaps, yeah. Could be. Well, what do you want? I don't know what it is. Man. I just feel in a mess at the moment. I don't know what what I, what I want. I don't know what I don't want. I don't know what I want to do, and I don't know what I don't want to do. I just, I'm just a bit mixed up. I think. You know, we had your assessment meeting this morning, and you've been asking me what's going to happen. Well, I can tell you what hasn't happened. You're not going back home. We think your problems are sufficiently big for some specialists to uh, be involved with you. We also think that some of the things that you do creates problems for you and creates problems for other people. And that we can't allow for some of those things to go on. Well, how do you feel about that? I'm very happy. Eh? Not very happy. No, I know you're not. No. There isn't very much we can do about it, Michael. You've been here long enough, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Are you getting fed up with staying in this place? Uh -huh. You are? Uh -huh. Yeah, I know. I know it doesn't make you happy, but there isn't very much we can do about it. Aye, well, as I said before, we don't think it would be right for you to go back to an ordinary school. It wouldn't be good for you, it wouldn't be good for other people. Okay, son, what is going to happen is that you're going to be at Hakeley for the next three or four weeks. Until we've found out exactly who's going to have you where. Okay? I have a, a kind of subconscious hatred towards the system. I try not to let it ferment too much because it can be destructive. Even though I've had so much negative things happen in my life, I've got to continue to be positive. However, I do feel so sad sometimes about all the years that I've gone before. I can't put it into words, you know how I mean? It's so frustrated that sometimes I actually sweat. And I can't explain to myself how I feel. I can't put it into a neat little package. Thirteen years is a long time. I've done longer than some people do for taking love. Now, 40 Minutes On finds out what's happened to Minnie in the 21 years since he was last filmed. I had finally reached my rite of passage, and in doing so was confronted by a terrible truth. A part of my life has died. The most exciting part. Carefree, reckless, and slightly dangerous. Days of whispering secrets to the wind, and of a truth unfettered by the complex, sometimes tedious expectations of adulthood. My journey began inauspiciously, standing at a bus stop on a typically cold, damp, and misty January morning. Well, after the second film, I sort of went into decline for... I think it was about four or five years. Um, my behaviour was becoming more and more erratic, uh, my thinking more and more bizarre. Um, and at that time, not, none of these problems were, were, were being diagnosed. And I just reached the point when I, when I got to about 27 where I, I sort of abdicated responsibility for my own life. Basically, I couldn't cope anymore. Um, I, I went to a factory yard and set fire to some wooden crates, and, and for that I received a life sentence.
by setting the fire, it was uh, a means of saying, look, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I don't know how to live out here anymore. I need help. I was still trying to get a diagnosis for the mental health problems that I'd suffered, not only within the community, but whilst I was in prison, the same kind of behavior started to manifest itself again. I wasn't 100% sure of what was wrong with me. I knew I was suffering mental health problems, and, and, and I tried and tried and tried to get it diagnosed. And it was eventually diagnosed is bipolar affective disorder, which is the, the, the new term for manic depression. Once diagnosed, Minnie was immediately transferred into hospital. From there, he was released on life license back into the community. Since then, he hasn't started any more fires. I've never been comfortable around strangers. Never really understood convention or its purpose. It seems clear to me that social norms are merely there to act as a lower tier level, to provide people who patently have nothing to say with a voice. Well, I prefer my own. The interest that periodically has been shown in my life has resulted in several people over the years saying, why don't you write your story? It would make a great book. I never thought I'd write it, because I didn't want to. But then I was given an idea of, of why don't you fictionalise it, and I got to thinking about it, and I thought, yeah, I've got all the research material in my head. <laughs> all I have to do now is write it down. The way in which I worked when I wrote the book is... I always planned it, whereby... I would try and feel what I wanted to say. I wouldn't write a single word on the computer until I could feel it. And part of the process was that I would obviously have to revisit places that um, I'd grown up in or visited at some point in my life. Um, in one of the places I, I had to go back to emotionally <clears throat> and psychologically was the village of Craighead where I lived from a very early age. Right behind us here is a row of terraced houses called Lambton Terrace, which is where I first moved to um, when we moved here in about 1970, 71. Um, the middle house of this row, that's the house that I actually set fire to. Yeah, I mean, this um, whole situation was really a, pretty much a defining moment in my life the way in which it propelled me on a journey um, that, that I couldn't predict the outcome of. Um, the huge impact it had generally. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, there's a lot of regret. In 1996, Minnie's father died after a long illness. I remember going into the church and the, the coffin was on some kind of a trolley on wheels, anyway. And I remember just going up to the coffin and looking at it and thinking, God, you're not a monster after all just a man in a box. Quite humbling, really. When we got you put in there, Show we didn't do to get you locked away purposely that we didn't want you. You know, we don't hear you. But now he's gone. He's not in my life anymore. He's not the shadow that's constantly followed me about for God knows how many years, lurking in every corner, you know. He's gone. He can't hold me by the shoulders and drag me back all the time. I'm free. So what did you do when you came in here? Please. I'm in a wonderful relationship. 
I'm actually in love for the first time in my life, which is amazing, really. What Alex did ultimately is she provided a safe environment. She made me feel safe. Ah, you want to play poo sticks? Poo sticks? What's poo sticks? You don't know what poo sticks is? Never heard of it. Right, Right. I was getting angry and upset, and she was like, it's okay to be upset, it's legitimate. You know, you have every reason to be upset, you have every reason to be angry, let it out, be angry, you know. And, and because I trust her and felt safe around her, I was able to do that. And it was only then, finally, was I able to let go. Okay. Right. Throw it over. Okay. 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 What's wrong with your Go. Oh, wow, yours has beaten mine. Wait, see which one? Oh, my oh yours is miles ahead. Right there. Do you know your bridge? I spent a long time trying to get away from that little boy, or that image of that little boy, particularly um, as presented in Inside Story, because clearly there was some potential there, you know, which perhaps only now is beginning to be realised sort of 31, 32 years later. Yeah, um, better late than never, eh? Yeah, I resented him for a, for a long time. I actually resented that little boy, yeah. Yeah. Just chuck you in and hope for the best. The first draft of Minnie's novel is now finished and ready to take to his publisher, Frank Rodham. Frank directed the first film about Minnie in 1975 and has kept in close contact ever since. When I made that film, I won the Critics' Award. It... it I was jumping on his back to advance my career. And later on, I got a feature film, Quadrophenia. I then got invited to Hollywood. I made some Hollywood pictures. You know, and he's part of, you know, and I feel I can't just take, I have to give back. It was great that I met Frank and the relationship I've shared with Frank over many years certainly helped keep me going. Um, I've drawn enormous amounts of inspiration from Frank. Because had I not met Frank, it would have been a very lonely old world. Well, I'm just getting me things ready for London. Uh, train tickets have gone in. Always got to make sure I've got the phone with me. This is the important one. The manuscript. It's time to uh, chuck it to the wind and see which direction it takes. I am nervous, yeah. I'm excited and nervous at the same time, really. Um, this book's been 30 years in the making, and it's, uh, I suppose it's a bit like having a child when the child decides to leave home. Um, and I feel a little bit like that towards it, really. There's no place to hide now. Certain irony, I suppose, when I was 11 years old, I was forever jumping trains and going off to see Frank. Little did I realise that 30 years later I would be getting on the train to take him a manuscript of a book I hope he'll publish. So it's almost like the whole journey's come full circle. So I boarded the train and as I settled uncomfortably into my seat I was once again transported back to the wonderful summer of 76. How enormously exciting it was to travel approximately 250 miles, dodging, amongst other things, ticket collectors and the dodgy. My relationship with Minnie right now is not one of me helping Minnie. My relationship with Minnie is with, we're friends. It's been a 30-odd year friendship. And uh, I can help him in a small way, the same way that friends help each other. Uh, and believe me, if Minnie's book is a success, um, I'm a publisher, I'll make money out of it. It's a proper relationship, it's an adult relationship. It's not, uh, it's an adult friendship. I don't feel that great sense of responsibility for Minnie anymore. What I feel is that he's a pal. The magic actually happened quite by accident. Up to that point, I, I had very much been a loner. I was very mistrustful of people because, by and large, 
I was living on my wits a lot of the time. Um, other people wanted to lock me up all the time, so I didn't trust them. Then I suddenly discovered that through the magic, people wanted to know me, wanted to be around me. Um, oh, man, go on, show us a trick, show us a card trick, man. And it became uh, it, 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 a sociable thing. And, and suddenly, from being this character who didn't really have a peer group, was always kind of living on the cusp, suddenly I was popular. And that was a huge thing for me at that time. The thing about magic is, it's pretend. It's, uh, you, you create a false reality. Um, and really, um, there was a connection to my life. Um, my life was a bit of an illusion at that time. I was creating a false reality. You know? And with magic, you trick people all the time. You deceive people. That's what it's about. But the person I most tricked was myself. And the minute I realized that, the minute I realized that the illusion on stage was, was, was like connected to the illusion in my life, I couldn't do it anymore. I completely lost my nerve. And from that moment on, I never, I never performed another magic trick. Hi Frank, it's Minnie. Hey Minnie. Hi. How are you? I'm I'll, I'll call you back. Bye. Good to see you. How are you doing, buddy? I'm all right. Yeah. You? Good trip. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Train actually arrived early, yeah? believe it or not. Let me just close the door. So it was all right, yeah. 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 Things are good. Things are good. I have the. Uh, Oh my god, how yeah. extraordinary! Well, wow. fantastic. Mission itself. I need to find There's nothing in there. There's nothing in there. Really, you lied <laughs> I know, to me. I know, I've put it in the wrong. <laughs> I've opened the wrong section of the case. <laughs> ah, here we are. Oh, fantastic. There oh, you go. Fantastic, Minnie. <laughs> how wonderful. Yeah. Let me see. 200 pages? Almost. Ah, oh, brilliant. Well Almost. done. Yes. What an achievement, man. Fantastic. Well done. <laughs> That's you. fantastic. Huh? Just think, eh? I know. What an amazing thing to do. He's now proven himself. You know, he hasn't lit a fire for more than 20 odd years. Um, he's written a novel, which is extraordinary. And um, I just feel, yes, I want him to, to reach his full potential because I think uh, he was abused by the system. If I had a wish, it would be that Minnie could get back to the same strength and power that he had when he was 10. Look, he was such a clear-headed child. He had such strength and such intelligence. It was beaten out of him. My role in society now is to not be afraid of it. Because I've lived in fear for probably all my life but I don't anymore. <laughs> My grandfather told me many years ago, always make sure your feet are pointing in the right direction. Well, finally they do. And on Thursday, 40 Minutes Classic, The Fishing Party, and a chance to see whether the very strong views expressed have changed at all in the intervening years.